Luke 9 23 said let him deny himself what does it mean to say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ a lot of us stop at the cross stop with John 3 16 because we don't truly understand how big the cross is
So what, I, what I've got to do is hopefully just give you an overview because I think it's important to understand what our children are taught in school anyway. I think it's to understand, important to understand where that comes from and I think it's important to be able to do more than just say, well, that's not in the Bible, therefore it's not true. Sometimes children need just a tad bit more than that and I want to make sure that we're prepared to do that. So let's start with the Big Bang Theory. Now, if you have heard of the Big Bang Theory, and I'm not talking about the television show, just give me a, a hand raise. So I know what I'm doing. Okay. Well, we've heard a little bit about the Big Bang Theory. Now, what about evolution? Have you heard a little bit about evolution? Okay. Evolution being the theory of natural selection or evolution from a common ancestor, commonly known as Darwinian evolution or Darwinism. Well, we're going to start with the Big Bang Theory because that is supposedly how everything boomed into the existence. Now, here's a quick overview. The Big Bang Theory says that approximately 14 billion years ago, let me come up with these numbers, I have no idea, 14 billion years ago, there was absolutely nothing. And then nothing happened, and that caused a big explosion, and then we had something. That's what it says. Makes sense to me. Not really. But it says that everything at the beginning, even though there was nothing, was sucked into a speck the size of a pinhead, and then nothing happened to it, and then a big explosion happened, and all of a sudden, that enormous spark, the Big Bang, and then over time, everything slowly began to form and take shape. And it took 14 billion years to do that. Things like subatomic particles and atoms and so on and so forth would become more and more complex. They were very simple and then they got more and more complex. And eventually things like stars and planets and galaxies would form and eventually that would lead to our own, the Milky Way forming and uh, our own solar system. And then our own planet Earth would form and when it cooled down enough, it would cool down enough to support life. And that's what we're told to believe. Which, by the way, they offer no explanation of how life got here. That just says how things got to the point that it can support life. It never tells you how life got here. Now, some of you may scoff right at the beginning of that, as I am very tempted to do, and say it's ludicrous as I'll get out, and say that, well, the Bible says different, and you know, we talked about last week how 2,000 of the 2,500 prophecies in the Bible are true, so that's enough for me, and if the Bible doesn't say it, it's crazy. That's very tempting to, to do that. And some others may ask, well, it sounds reasonable, why can't I just believe in both? Well, I, I hope to address both of those issues this morning. So let's begin by jumping directly to the point. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis, the first chapter. And we'll just look at a few verses of Scripture. Why can't we believe in both? Now, we discussed last week about how the Bible says that it is from God. It says, it makes that claim about itself, it calls itself the Word of God, and so forth. What does it say about creation? By the way, this is the only scripture I'm using today. Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. 
Well, there are those that say that perhaps that day wasn't a literal day, that it was an age, that it was months or years even. That's called the day-age theory. And how do I feel about it? It depends on what day you ask me. It doesn't matter. The point is, the Bible gives us a progression of what happened one after the other. It gives us an order. Well, why couldn't that spark mentioned in the Big Bang have been let there be light? Well, this, this is what we have to deal with. If we take the Bible literally, and we have to, that spark would have been able, would have, would have had to have happened out of sequence to what the Bible tells us occurred. It would have had to have happened out of order. Because the Bible says that God created heaven and earth first. Then he said, let there be light. And it's very easy, easy to imagine God saying, let there be light, and then a huge explosion occurred, like the Big Bang before. But then take a look at what Scripture says. First, he created the heavens and the earth. But then there was nothing for the while. And then the Holy Spirit finds himself hovering over the waters. Darkness. Formless. Then in verse 3, that momentous let there be light occurs. I've seen Bible programs that try to explain this in a way that goes along with what kids learn in school, but it puts things out of order. And they simply cannot jive together, but it, it, just, it just doesn't work. To believe that uh, says that either the Bible events are wrong, in which case we said the whole thing falls apart, or the Big Bang theories of events are out of sequence, which makes it to fall apart, because it says that we went from very simple to more complex, as does the theory of evolution, which we'll deal with later. Now let me illustrate why. The Big Bang theory says that everything you see, all matter, everything you see around us, Again, it's very, very complex. A small spot of nothing exploded. As Mark Lowry says, there was a gaseous belch in the universe. And then over time, it developed into more and more complex things. If it didn't happen in that order, it can't stand. Well, we discussed last week how the Bible's events are able to stand up against scrutiny. But what about the Big Bangs? What about it? Leave the Bible to the side for just a minute. For just a minute. And let's look at it through their eyes. Through their terms. Here's my first argument. The concept of going from simple to more complex is faulty. Where does that happen in the universe that you go from simple to more complex? Besides children being born. Which they can't explain either. <laughs> See, the Big Bang says that we were very simple and then we went to more complex. My question is, where do you see that around you? Where do you see a single cell organism like a skin cell develop into something more complex? Where do you see a germ turn into a frog and then a frog turn into a rabbit and a rabbit turn into a monkey and then you have me? Where do you see that happen? That doesn't happen to me. Things break down. They don't build up, things break down. Watch, watch the human body. We begin dying at, at birth. We really do. We, we kind of get over a hill. You know, we, we grow up and then we start to deteriorate. We know that. We know that. Things deteriorate. When you see something die, it doesn't turn into another living thing. It breaks down. Things go from complex to simple, not simple to complex. So it doesn't hold up. And I'll revisit that concept in a moment when we get to evolution, but let's move forward. So the simple to complex doesn't work. Let's move to my next argument. The math doesn't add up. This is my favorite. And I hate math. I'm sorry. I just do. That's why I teach history, because I can't handle math. But this is simple math. I can do this. I can do this. The Big Bang Theory says that nothing and that something 
a big bang, caused by nothing, caused something to form. Okay? Back up. Well, let's see. We know that something plus something gives us two something, right? We know that one plus one equals two. We can all do that. So, if we had something, and then something acted on it, then the Big Bang could have happened. But it says there was nothing. And then nothing happened, and then we had something. Am I going in circles? That doesn't make sense to me. If you're lost, I am too. That's not what the Big Bang says. It says there was nothing, and then that. There was nothing, and then that caused everything we see around us to form. Chance. It says there was a big boom, and then over time, chance formed what we have now. I can't believe that. Folks, what does nothing plus nothing give you? Zero. Zero. Nothing. A small child can tell you that the question itself is stupid. Nothing plus nothing gives you nothing. A small child can tell you that it takes more than a random gaseous belch in the universe to go from a small cell to the man who invented the computer chip. Even if it has millions and billions of years to do that, that doesn't make sense. Look, I love my iPod. Absolutely love it. It has so many functions, helps me out in so many different ways. So much technology packed into this little tiny area. I was a kid. I often thought it would be nice to have a small little computer that I could carry everywhere I went and video chat with somebody as so long as I had the internet. So I thought it was really cool. But I thought that was science fiction. Never saw it happening. I watched James Bond and he had the little, little watch with a screen on it and he could talk to somebody or Batman. I never thought I'd see that happen, but here it is. Here it is. So much technology packed in this little area, but you know the thing, the thing about it is I can look at this thing and tell that it has a maker. It has a creator. I can look at the creation and see it has a creator. Look at your clothes. There wasn't an explosion in a cotton factory that he had a shirt. Someone made it. Someone made it. And I would never look at this thing. It has the Apple logo and it says iPod. I would never assume that there was an explosion in the iPod factory and this thing came together over millions and millions of years in a way that it functioned. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. I can tell it has a maker. Furthermore, I couldn't take it apart into all its little pieces and put it in a bag and shake it for millions and millions of years and expect to pull out a working iPod. That doesn't make any sense. But that's what you are told. That's what your kids are told to believe happened in the universe. It doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. But you can look at the creation. You can look around you. Look around you. You can tell this creator. The order in the universe, the way gravity works. You can tell. The numbers tell you that there is a creator. I believe that the Big Bang is, is a bust. And you're free to check that out further because I only hit a couple of points. And it's so much more complicated than that. I couldn't do that in the morning. But let's go on to evolution. Charles Darwin taught that over time, things developed and got more and more complicated. Now, that's not his initial hypothesis. He went to the Galapagos Islands, and he observed the finches between the different islands and how their beaks were different depending on the types of food that they ate. Now, I would say God. God provided for those finches in a way that they could eat, because if your beak is a certain way, and you're a bird, you can't eat fruit. But if it's a certain way, and it needs to be in such a way that it can crack open a nut so you can eat what's there, that doesn't work either. So their beaks were different depending on what they ate. He said natural selection, uh, things changed over time, survival of the fittest. 
And all of that research led to evolution that we, as we know it today. Evolution from a common ancestor. It says that we started all very simply, but it doesn't say how that started, by the way. But it said it started very simply, and things built up over time. That's what it says. Much like the Big Bang Theory says, that things went from simple to complex. Both of them, as I just said, completely fail to say how life began. You ask that question, and I've asked that of, of many professors I've had over the years. How did it start? We don't know. But we don't know yet. Science will explain that, they said. It's very weak. It's like it is. It's, sure weak. it's all weak. It all, and this one guy said, well, they started on the backs of crystals because they're the most organized things in, in uh, nature. They say, they fail to say how life began. Richard Dawkins. You heard of Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins is an Oxford professor. And he's sort of the leader in evolutionary psychology. And he's the guy that goes around and, and he's written a book called The God Delusion. And he just is, he's one of these atheist guys that, um, that co really comes after us and says, you know, you, you know uh, there's no point in church and, and so forth. And he even encouraged people at, a, at an atheist gathering. There was a giant, looked like a big uh, party of atheists and he encouraged them to go out and um, ridicule, ridicule people that believe in God. He encouraged them to do that. He's the world's leading evolutionary uh, psychologist. He says this, that science simply doesn't know how life began, but they don't know yet. But it wasn't God. Weak. See, that takes faith for him. That's what he doesn't realize. And, and I love Dr. John Lennox because Dr. John Lennox is also an Oxford professor of math. And he sticks it to him. They, they've debated a few times. And he says, that takes faith for you to believe that science will eventually tell you what happened. He said, no, it doesn't. He said, yes, it does. That takes faith. You, you have faith that's in science. The science is going to explain that. <clears throat> He says that that takes no faith. And they just kind of went back and forth about that. That's kind of funny. He says that science is going to say that. But see, the thing about it is, science can, cannot prove it. Therefore, it is a science. Because he says that anything that science can, can't prove, you shouldn't believe. Again, we don't have a single single example of things going from simple to complex. I love this one. I've told y'all this one many times. The Georgia Cetus is supposedly, supposedly, a link species. It supposedly says, because this says that things were all in the water at one point, they eventually grew legs and came up on land. Okay? That's what we're told to believe. If you go in the Georgia Southern Museum, there's something called the Georgia Cetus. It's a whale skeleton that was found around Augusta. And the man that found it says that it had legs. But if you read the sign under it, you'll see that that thing didn't have legs when he found it. He put legs on it. But when asked why he did that, he said, well, the way that the hip bones were shows, shows that it had legs at one time, so we put legs on it. This man sold a book. The Georgia Cetus has a Wikipedia page, a little animated cute It was just a baby whale. That's all it was. He got a professorship at FSU because of that. But it's, it's garbage. Every time they've tried to show that link, it hasn't been uh, proven. Or many times they've been proven false. There was one at the Smithsonian for a hundred years that was supposedly the link, the missing link between monkeys and people. Come to find out the man lied. He had taken the jawbone of a man and put it on a monkey's head. Garbage. The example.
rules don't exist that show that this happened. Things break down. They don't become more complicated. I can think of no better example of God's ingenuity than DNA. How complicated DNA is. How many strands are in the genome uh, sequence now? The basic building code is what, of life is what DNA is. If you look at it, a single strand can fill up a 400 volume encyclopedia. A single strand. Where did that come from? Random chance? Or was it written by a creator? That's a common, that's a common theory, but, but putting that aside, putting that aside, how many of you have ever used a copy machine? I live in the copy room, being a teacher. Have you ever made, made a copy? We've made a copy, right? Have you ever made a copy of that copy? Have you ever made a copy of a copy of a copy? What happens? It gets worse and worse and worse. It breaks down. That's what should happen according to this, to the DNA sequence. It should get less and less good. Why haven't we become weaker? I know you take part from the dad and part from the mom and you put them together, but why haven't they broken down over time? Because that's what happens in nature. That's God to me because we can't explain that. That's, that's remarkable. It really is remarkable how, how God works. Look, I think I think you can see that there are issues here. Even if you've still got thoughts in your mind that maybe I haven't uh, haven't settled yet for you. But I think you can see there's issues. There's real issues in both of those. I had an aunt who I dearly love try to tell me, um, because she asked me uh, in a way, her own way, she said, uh, how do you feel about them teaching uh, creationism in, in, uh, in schools? And she kind of laughed and I said, um, I said, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to, you'd have to be more specific. You have to be more specific. How uh, how would you go about doing that? Are you talking about a science class? Are you talking about having a Bible class? What are you talking? What are you asking me? She said, "Well, the, uh, she said your people are talking about removing evolution." And she, and I said, "Well, what would be your problem with removing evolution?" I said, "I'm not saying I have a problem. I'm just wondering what your problem is with with removing it." She said, "Because it's proven fact." No, it's not. That's why it's called a theory. Until we have the guy from the time machine movie that invents the thing, we can sit in and go back in time and watch this stuff happen. It's not proven and it can't be proven. It's what you choose to fill in the gaps in your own mind about how we got here. It's faulty. You see, the modern world tries to tell you that you've got to choose between science and faith. That's about as intelligent, in my mind, as we know the Model T was, right? From Henry Ford. Okay. The first good functioning car, all right? Yeah, he, he utilized the assembly line, and he utilized interchangeable parts, and he put all that together in a factory, and he was able to produce uh, affordable automobiles. Well, if I had a Model T out here, a running, working Model T, and I, and I put it outside for you. And I said, you have a choice for how this thing got here. Here's Henry Ford. You can have Henry Ford. Or you can have uh, the laws of physics, internal combustion, all the things that it takes to make a car work, the assembly line, all those things. Please choose Henry Ford or that thing. Well, that's absurd. You know that. It takes both. It took the creator and it took all of those things to come together that the creator didn't come up with. He just learned to use. You need both. You can see that, can't you? You need the creator and you need the means of creation. <clears throat> you see, they try to tell your kids 
the school that they have to choose between the two. But it takes more faith in my mind to believe that all of this came out of chance than the Creator actually did what He does. And that is be awesome and create. You see, uh, understanding how something works doesn't make the Creator obsolete. The more you know about art, as Gail will tell you, the more you know about art and paint and uh, perspective and all those things, it doesn't make appreciating a Rembrandt painting or a Picasso painting obsolete. It doesn't make your respect for those creators go down. It should make an increase. You understand how brilliant they were. Understanding about music, in my mind, all the music, music things I do, understanding about music in my mind doesn't make me appreciate any less Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. It makes my appreciation explode for them. Wow, that was, when I look at the, the sheet music for Moonlight Sonata, my, my brain just explodes. I'm like, how do you do that? How do you do that? Look for your hymnal sometimes. Just, sometimes. Just, just look for it. Those songs are brilliant. The lyricist that put words to those music is just as um, admirable as the person that actually came up with the chorus to make those beautiful songs. But understanding about that doesn't make your appreciation go down. It should make it go up. Look at what Sir Isaac Newton did with gravity. When he came up with his theory about gravity, about the way things naturally go down, towards the earth. It made his respect for God go up. It didn't explain away God. It just showed you more about God. How awesome God is. You see, before Isaac Newton, they would look at an object and they would say, this thing has gravity, therefore it falls. <laughs> Newton took that and flipped it. He said, no, it's not that it has gravity, it's that the earth has gravity and pulls it down. He said that's the way God designed it. It didn't explain away God, it showed more about God. When I reflect on gravity, when I think about it, it blows my mind. The fact that the earth spins on its axis just fast enough that we don't float off into space, but not too fast that we're pinned down to the earth. The fact that it tilts on its axis and that it's also spinning so that we, we don't burn up and we get just enough sunlight we can grow food that we don't burn up. That's God. The distance we are from the sun so that we don't burn up. I mean, if we'd have been on any other planet, Mars is too cold. As much as we try to compare Earth and Mars, Mars is too cold. It's just in the right place. God made that work. It blows my mind. It's brilliant. We would dare say it's caused by randomness. By chance times matter plus time. I don't have enough faith to believe that. It takes more faith to believe that in my view. Last thing here and I'll be finished. Many of these people get hung up on the, on the question. I've had a student ask me, well, who created God? That one's simple to me. What does the scripture say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That makes the statement, that makes the claim that God doesn't have a creator, He just always was. But that blows their mind. They can't understand it. Well, He was there if He created everything, so they had to have created Him. He's the unmovable mover, as Thomas Aquinas said. Unshakable shaker. He was always there. There was God was always. He always is. He always was. He always will be. There never was a time when he wasn't. There never will be a time when he isn't or won't be. He just is there. He always was there. They can't believe that. Richard Dawkins, I told you about him a minute ago, he said that God is more complicated than the Big Bang or evolution because we don't know where he came from. And 
because he's more complicated than the explanation we have, you know, he's not plausible. We can't describe him, so he's not science. And he's more complicated. Well, I take this coach very handle, and uh, it's pretty complicated, but I can believe what's in it. I mean, there's hymns I can, you know, I can read through, and I, it's plausible. But the, th the person that got together, what was his name? I know his first name. First name was what? Remember? Last name Coates, very obviously. Well, I know he created this thing, but he's even more complicated than this thing, so therefore I shouldn't believe it. That's ridiculous. That's what their argument is. That assumes that just because we can't describe it means that it doesn't exist. That is, the, that is the arrogance of man. That is our arrogance. We don't have to be able to understand something completely to know it exists, yet we insist on that. Look around you. Have you ever sat in a deer stand and watched this, how beautiful a sunrise is? We know how this, where the sunrise comes from. It comes from the rotation of the earth. But we cannot describe its beauty. Even a picture doesn't describe its beauty. It just shows it. And it shows a less complicated, less complex copy of what you saw. It's one of those things where you say you had to have been there. You can't describe that. And what is beauty anyway? You see, you can't look at the creation and assume that there is no creator. That's not intelligent. God is there, and his word is trustworthy. We talked about that last week. Science cannot disprove it. In fact, it often supports it. Do you remember last week we talked about archaeology? We talked about how the things that they found buried underground support the stories in the Bible. Those five cities uh, from the Sodom and Gomorrah destruction story, those five cities, they found remains exactly where the Bible says those cities were. Archaeology shows that the uh, that Jericho, it supports the Jericho story, that it was heavily fortified and the people just picked up and ran off. And they left their houses completely intact. They didn't even pack. It supports. That supports what the Bible says. So you can look at the creation to believe in the Creator. Or you can believe that nothing came from nothing, caused by nothing. That over time, matter, time's chance, you know, plus time eventually led people to, uh, or, you know, uh, 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 sail to develop into this, to that, to that, to that. Eventually we have a God that comes up with the microchip. And then we've got Steve Jobs comes along and eventually uh, Vic has an iPod. That doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense. That really is the choice. Now, I know I've packed a lot of stuff in one Sunday. But we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on this and still miss the point. I could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on this delving into what I perceive the problems are, but other people say the problems are in evolution and the Big Bang Theory. But we, if we miss the point, it was all in vain. So that's why I was just fine fitting it into one day because I'm ready to get back in and exegete the Bible, honestly. But I think it's important that we talk about this because when you're told and you're bombarded constantly, constantly by our naturalistic people around us in society that say, you can't believe that it's unreasonable. Your question from today should be, will you tell me your reasonable alternative? You tell me that it's more reasonable to believe that things just, you know, went from nothing, and then nothing happened, and now we have something, and something developed over time. You tell me how that's more reasonable than believing that what the Bible, what, that you cannot disprove you know, says God created the world. You, you, 
you tell me how that's more reasonable than what the Bible says? I can't find it. And I'm going to tell you that uh, I, I set out many years ago because I was stubborn to put my mind at ease and just say, okay, evolution is true, the Big Bang Theory is true. The more I look into this stuff, the more I'm like, that's ridiculous. I have to believe what Scripture says. It's the only reasonable alternative. That 2,000 plus 2,500 prophecies would come true cannot be chance. Cannot be coincidence. That really is the choice. The question is not whether or not God created the world anymore. The question is what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? Because when the Bible says that God created the world and God is almighty and that we are yet fallen and we deserve hellfire because we are fallen. And it says that he provided a way out for you because he is merciful and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. When it says those things, what is our response? Just shake our heads or think about it or let it go. What's our response? It's no longer about whether or not created. God created the world. God created the world quite honestly, whether you believe any of what I just said or not. Or whether you believe what I just what I said last week, or whether you believe what I'm going to talk about next week. He created the world. Whether we believe it or not. The question is what we're going to do about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have a sense of humor. We thank you that, yes, we can believe the Bible because it's absolutely legitimate, it's absolute truth, it cannot be disproven, but we also thank you for what you've given us in science. We thank you for what you've given us in physics. Yeah, we may have discovered them, Isaac Newton may have discovered gravity or the way gravity works and came up with the mathematical equations to calculate it, but God, he didn't invent it. You invented gravity. You make things in the way that they are so that life can operate here the way you intended. And we give you the honor and the glory and the praise for that. We thank you that we're able to believe the more we look into these things, we're able to believe more and that our faith can be strengthened. We would ask that you would go with us now from here, and God, I know I, I know I didn't do you justice on these issues, but God, I hope that maybe it's given somebody some peace. But it's certainly given me peace, and I, I personally give you my own gratitude and praise for that. Be, be with us as we leave from here, and just help us to shine for you. Help us to.